Hey, good to see everyone. Father Ian Van Heusen here with Tristan. Um, he's a good friend of mine. We've known each other for years. We've known each other for like almost maybe close to 10 years now. Yeah. Five years a priest, like five years as a seminarian. So what I wanted to talk with Tristan about was he's the head of our, our African-American and African ancestry ministry. Amen for the Diocese of Raleigh. Just a, a, a great speaker, a depth of knowledge. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about racism. I had a conversation earlier in the day with somebody who I knew um, from the past about racism as well. And I just want to kind of, that talk might be posted at a separate time. But I want to just start off. What are your thoughts? Just, if you could just fill us in a little bit. How do you perceive a little bit what's been going on? You can start wherever you want. As vague, that's as open-ended as you want. Start where you want. Um, well, okay. So where do we fi find ourselves when we are, we're discussing race today? Um, I think it's a lot of things going on. So there's a lot of moving p parts. Um, so I think history is, is um, something that um, we would wanna take a look at. Mm -hmm. um, I would also have people take a look at um, who may be the um, agitators or who are the people looking for influence, right? So, you know, is it the political area? You know, are the politicians, you know, feeding into this? You know, are there organizations that have a financial stake in this? You know, are, are they ones that are perpetuating this issue? Um, you know, and also not only who are the active people that are um, maybe behind the screen, you know, doing things, but are there inactive people who are, you know, not stepping up to make the situation better? when when they have the ability to um so you know you kind of have the ones who are on the sidelines um you have some people who have a stake in it mm -hmm. you, you know either for good or ill and then you also have um you know some um you know people who are just sitting there going you know what uh, haven't we gotten beyond that come on you know let's just keep moving on and it's like well you know this keeps getting worse every time um, it boils up. And so we, we really need to find out where this evil of racism comes from and really show it for what it is and then understand that this is an evil that will be with us forever until, you know, the Lord comes back and, you know, settles the score. But in the meantime, we have to address this especially people at a church um, on every generation. So I think this is, this is where I see us right now, kind of all of those um, powers and hands in the pot, you know, mixing up and, and we need to really get in there and, and uh, um, fight the good fight continuously. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's some really great points. I think I just want to highlight three things and kind of come back to them again and flesh them out a little bit. So we both agree that racism exists. I love the fact that you talked about how we're not going to create a perfect society. So that's one thing that's important, that view that we'll create a perfect society where there's no racism, that kind of utopianism, probably not in line with the Christian anthropology, right? Because right. we understand we have a fallen human nature, our tendency, concupiscence is towards sin, that we will have to constantly renew ourselves the same way we have to do with every sin. Um, and we would say that racism is sin, it's a violation of justice to what's due the person. Um, I also, I, I think one of the things that I, I think before we get into the history, just the dynamics, actually some speakers and some thinkers have brought this out. One of the, the great strengths we have in America, and one of the things that's profoundly difficult is it's such a mixing pot of different cultures and different ethnicities. So there is almost a need in every generation with that diversity to do a kind of sensitivity training or just understanding of different viewpoints within our society. Right. And, and I agree with you hundred percent there. And I think uh, this is something that we had mentioned um, a little bit earlier when we were talking too, because if you think about it, I'm, I was born in 69. Well, mm -hmm. you know, four or five years prior to that, um, where I grew up in Cleveland, you know, we had one of the biggest race riots um, mm -hmm. in the city. And it was probably maybe, three or four miles down the street from the street I grew up on, you know, in, in the neighborhood. So you sit back and you go, wow, 
during my mother's time of being a young adult, the world in Cleveland was on fire. But then if you think about where we have come since then, because I mean, I was in a position where, you know, most of those hard struggles that my mother's generation with the segregation and everything had to, um, to deal, well, not um, desegregation was, you know, probably around her time. But before that, my grandmother was dealing with this uh, segregation. And then you think um, even before that, my great grandmother was dealing with, um, you know, the Jim Crow mm -hmm. stuff. And then you know, my great, great grandmother in that generation, they were actually dealing with slavery, right? So I think when we're talking about this whole racism and how um, we look at racial um, relationships, we need to hit this every generation because yeah, we're moving forward, but there's still some things. And like I said, there's some hands that are in the background that have, uh, have stake in this mm -hmm. issue. And um, they have been you know, actively working to either keep it going or to try to take our eye off the focus of what we're all really called to do. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. I'm curious, when you were growing up, so one of the important parts of my family history is telling stories of our ancestors, right? So my family is, uh, on my, my dad's side goes back to the Mayflower. Um, we were very proud of our history. At one point, where there's abolitionists in the family. We fought for the North. Um, you know, I had family members that were suffragettes. Um, in, the, in the 20s. And so it was the, 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 and the daughter, my grandmother is a daughter of the American Revolution. So there was definitely a sense of my grandmother always instilled in us, what's the stories of our family and always constantly dwelling upon that. Was there a similar dynamic in your family? What, what were kind of the stories that were told? I mean, was it painful? Was it ugly? Was it, I mean, how, how did that, or was it, yeah. No, yeah. And, and actually, you know, as you're saying that, you know, that's one of the things that you have um, the luxury of having yeah. that I don't have. I mean, I'm still, my grandmother passed away last year and um, she was 90 years old. But I was, when I was looking at her in that coffin, I was thinking about, oh my gosh, you know, if there was any question that I wanted to ask her about history and our family history, if I didn't get that question answered, you know, there's no way of going back and, you know, getting that now. Um, and you think about, um, I'm trying to go back and trace my lineage, lineage right now. And as far back as I can go, it's probably my great, great grandfather. And it's still sketchy with that, right? So a lot of African-Americans don't even have that luxury of being able to trace that back. You know, Alex Haley, you know, he was very fortunate when he went through roots and he was able to go back all the way. You know, I think, the best that I can get is my sharecropping um, great grandfather in in Alabama, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and the, and even those stories are kind of sketchy. So even to have that vibrant history that you can go back and look at, um, you know, I don't even have that luxury, and and that that's painful in itself. Which was a fascinating dynamic. I, I think I don't know if you lived through this because I'm trying to think. You were 69. So maybe you lived through it a little bit. That was one of the big tenets of the 80s and 90s, right? Because yep. there was the, uh, the Afrocentric move, movement. Um, yep. You had like, um, what's, what's, I mean, there was a song. I mean, like that was part of like, that, that was a time when people started dreading their hair a little bit more, um, things like that. The Afro, yeah. I don't know. It's just, in, it's an interesting dynamic because isn't that part of the, I mean, yeah. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. If no. you want to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because people were trying to get back to the root. So, you know, Alex Haley, and if you think about um, any people of um, African-American descent that are on here, you know, we had the big Afros and the dashiki, um, you know, shirts and, um, you know, the pick that you would stick in the back of your head with the big fist, you know, and it could be in the black, red and green or whatever. So, yeah, um, you know, that was a lot of things that we were really trying to get back to. Um, but yeah, so people were starting to think about that and it was all already a, look, let's keep moving because things have been taken away from us. We're trying to really regroup that in whatever way we can, so. Yeah, and it, it, it's an interesting 
challenging dynamic. Because I remember um, there's, a, you, well, you know the parish and you know some of the people, they're wonderful people. There's a little African-American parish in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And there's definitely a strong attempt in that church to have a very Afrocentric feel to it, um, which is, is interesting. I, I, don't, I don't always know what to make of that, but I think, I think it gets at part of the difficulties of what we face in America is that sense of not having a sense of your history and, and, um, and, and then being, uh, there's a, a certain discomfort with that history. Um, and we were kind of talking about it. It was interesting. We were talking, I think one of the dynamics right now is at first I, a little bit, I'll, I'll be honest, my reaction when all this flared up now, what, three or four weeks ago or five weeks ago or longer, I forget the exact timeline. I was coming from the standpoint that I saw a lot of the, the ways things were being manipulated to promote an agenda. But after I kind of cooled off and I got over this whole left conservative versus liberal dichotomy and really started to think about what I know and what I've learned over the years, there is truth to like things like what Archbishop Gregory said, where race, uh, slavery is America's original sin. There is an ugliness that we have to face. I think one of the challenges, generally speaking, for uh, 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 people of European descent in America, not so much your Italian immigrants or your Irish immigrants, they really have a different experience. But for folks who have a history in this country longer than that, is um, people whose, you know, their family goes back to the Confederacy or earlier. It's uncomfortable to face the sins of your fathers, right? Um, to see the bad things that were done. And we kind of talked about it is um, when you first start uncovering this kind of darkness there, it's like in psychology, when you start studying mental illnesses or in medicine, when you start studying diseases, everybody has, you have every disease in the book, you have every mental illness in the book. It's a common thing when people start to study things. I think that's part of the challenge is, is a lot of people, when they first start to study this history, it's profoundly uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, you know, and, and, and that's a, that's a reality. And, you know, we could look at any of the um, situations that have happened recently that sparked a lot of these riots and stuff. And you could look at any of those deaths and you could go back and you could break those down piece by piece. And you could sit there and say, okay, what are the truths out of everything that's going on through that whole um, line of occurrences or events in how do we find ourselves and in, in what could we have done better um, so that those outcomes wouldn't have been that way, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so I guess, um, and I just lost my train of thought there, but um, the, the, the important thing is we have to take this sin of racism and, 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 and the white supremacy and hit it head on mm -hmm. so that we can shine a light on it. And so we can basically let people know, hey, this is still going on today. And, you know, every generation, if they really want to, especially us in the church, mm -hmm. need to, uh, you know, be with the ones, the champions to step up and say, hey, not on my watch. Will this go down, um, you, you know, in this generation while, while I still have, you know, breath in me? Absolutely. A hundred percent. I think the... The, the beauty of the Catholic Church is we're uniquely positioned to, to, to represent what the world needs, which is, um, oh, don't worry, that's just a little thing. Every 30 minutes, long story, it's a camera glitch. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things I've always emphasized is being connected with the Catholic Church is being a part of a universal church where we have Africans, we have African-Americans. Um, I mean, there's a rich tradition of African-American Catholicism going back to St. Catherine Drexel or even before that. Yeah. Um, and there's also some ugliness in the church in America, but it really depends. It's almost like a North and a South thing a little bit. Um, but I think the reality is I, I never have realized until recently that segregation is still very prominent I don't think it's completely that it's forced, but it's very hard for people to step outside of their comfort zone 
and to get to know people who are of a different ethnicity than themselves. Like that's profoundly difficult for many people. Yeah. And I think um, you, you hit the nail on the head because I mean, you think about it, like you said, we are, have been friends for 10 years. Yeah. You know, my youngest son is named Ian. Right. <laughs> um, so and, and what was kind of cool about that is you think about it, we came from two different backgrounds, but, you know, as we spend more time with each other, you know, it's like, okay, you know, I don't look at Ian as this white guy and, you know, you don't look at me as a black guy, I just happen to be a, your Catholic friend that happens to be African-American, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, when we sit down and have those conversations with each other, mm -hmm. um, we share our history, we talk about um, you know, who we are and where we come from, then you start to understand, yeah. um, you, you, you know, a little bit about somebody. And then you start to look at them differently, right? You know, because, I mean, I'll take an example, you know, people crossing the border, you know, you, you look and go, oh, man, all those people, they're lawless, and they're doing this and this and this. But then when you sit down and you talk to them, and you like, you're like, well, my father, you know, had made a decision because my family was starving to death in the country that we're in. And I was like, you know what? It can't get any worse. So mm -hmm. I'd much rather risk my life and take them, you know, across the border to the United States where even the poorest person in the United States lives like a king compared to, you know, what I'm, what I'm living in. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that I would encourage everybody to realize, piggyback off that, you mentioned immigrants. I've worked a lot with immigrants over the years. Nothing is black and white. There are aspects of his, the Hispanic community in America that sometimes are against the law. There's some that are profoundly virtuous. The, there's, it's, it's, the nuances, I think that's one of the things I want to bring to social media and why I wanted to do this conversation is I believe right now most people in America on social media and different conversations, they're not going deeper. They're not digging into the nuances of things. So like, for example, so with George Floyd, when that blows up, there's one side that's like, it's all white people's fault. We need to, we need to overthrow the system because of the patriarchy. And, and, and then there's the other side that there's no problem. There's no racism. It's like, neither of those positions are particularly right. Like yeah. there's, there's a little bit more complexity to it. I think there is something about the felt experience. A lot of articles have pointed out um, those experiences, you know, they call them sometimes microaggressions and things like that. Those things are legit. But the funny thing is, is if you really, if you like step outside of your comfort zone and you're in environments where you're a minority, because as a priest, there are tons of situations where I'm a minority. Um, I've even had it sometimes where Hispanics are in Spanish talking about how much they can't stand Americans. Like, can you believe these Americans do this? And I'm kind of like sitting there, I'm like, <laughs> I'm an American, but okay. <laughs> oh, welcome to a day in my life, right? <laughs> exactly. But it, but it is a fascinating dynamic. I think it's, I mean, now I think what I was talking about in an earlier conversation, where I think there is some truth in the idea of systematic racism and white privilege, I think there is a tendency to favor your own, um, to favor your tribal allegiance. And the classic example that I'm going to give and continue to give is weddings. I don't know about you, but it's a fascinating dynamic. With weddings, almost universally, you go with your ethnic group for everything. So if it's a Hispanic wedding, it's a Hispanic photographer, Hispanic videographer, Hispanic florist, Hispanic dressmaker, you go down the list, right? Hispanic food. And normally it's like your, it's not just your ethnic group, it's like your country of origin. So it's Mexican, it's Mexican food, Mexican restaurant, Mexican hall, go down the list, right? Yeah. Um, and same with sometimes with African American, because I've, I've I was talking with somebody who does a, a, a makeup for weddings and an African American woman won't generally go to a white woman who does makeup because they, they just don't trust them. Um, and it's interesting because that tribal allegiance is not always a bad thing, but where I think it becomes a problem, and this is there is truth in this with white privilege, which is if if a majority of your big businesses are owned by white people, or if there's a white network, there can be a tendency, if we're not trained in a certain regard and made aware of it, to favor our own. Um, by the way, I think this happens a lot. I don't want to 
hopefully I don't draw undue attention. But I think with Catholics, especially in the South, there is a tendency sometimes to like trust other Catholics. It's not a white black thing or, or that because sometimes the Catholics are Filipino, they're Vietnamese, they're whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, Catholics, we tend to bond kind of, I mean, have you ever, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've, well, I mean, I know we've seen that because I mean, um, I've had people who are like, I need a job father, who can I call? And I call up like all of the big Catholics I know that are businessmen. I'm like, hey, do you have jobs for these people, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And as a matter of fact, I mean, and this is where the beauty of it is, especially for me, um, because I look at my history of um, a lot of the jobs that I was able to get, um, some pretty uh, nice jobs too, is because, you know, I had people that had a pretty good network. And believe it or not, those guys, the majority of them happen to be white, white people, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, even with, with my um, first professional job, I went into a temp agency and I remember this lady, her name was Ada Powell. And I, and I went to her and I was just like, okay, I'm here, you know, to get a temp job or whatever, but I was dressed up really nice. And she goes, you know, um, do you know how to use a computer? And that's when Apple had just come out with their little box uh, Mac and I had gone over to Kinko's and played around with it enough to uh, kind of figure you click on the box and it would open a window up. And so I said, yeah. And she, she goes, well, do you know PowerPoint, Excel and all this stuff? And I said, no. She goes, I tell you what, she goes, I want you to come back in and I'm going to have you test out on this um, um, computer based program on these different applications. And if you score well on them, then I'll send you out on some jobs. And I mean, she sent me out to uh, places like IBM and Nortel and, you know, Glaxo, which is, you know, where I actually started, started my career. So um, my professional career. Uh, so yeah, it, you, you know, having those networks and people, I guess, when we talk about white privileges, you know, if you have the network because you are in power, you can pull some strings um, that can't be pulled. Now, as some of the uh, African-Americans, Hispanics, you, you know, any other people, you know, get more affluent and they have networks, now they can leverage their network as well. But that wasn't always the case. Um, you know, anything that you did um, or you had was basically at the whim of some white guy calling the shots, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. Hold up a second. I, that's some great stuff. I want to try to see if I can pull up the comments. I should have done this beforehand. Okay. Let me see if I can, because we probably have had some people comment. Let me see. Uh, all right. Crap. Are you still there? Yep, I'm here. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's see if I, did I mess it up? Crap. I might have messed it up. Give me a second. Oh, we're still, oh, we're still on air. Okay. Sorry, folks, as I try to figure out some of this, this, uh, let's see. No. Uh, okay, I think we're back. Yeah, I just got to. Yeah, sorry, folks, if you're commenting, thanks. I'm sorry. I should have set this up beforehand. And I'll have to ask Tim, but um, but I didn't. I don't know how to do the, um, the comments. But anyways, this is still a good conversation. Normally, I like to interact with folks. Um, yeah, so yeah. It's a little bit tough. When we're not interacting. Well, do you? Do, well, what direction you want to take now? So we've been talking about for about twenty minutes. Do you want to dive into a little bit of the history that we discussed and kind of walk through it a little bit? Like we can start with the beginning and just see, kind of meander our way through it. Yeah. So. Um... Let's do it this way. Um, yeah. Let's look at um, the difference in the racial relations as we go through history. And yeah. so let's, let, let's talk about pre-United States, okay? Yeah. And, and we can start this as we're um, coming this from the position of the church. I mean, you think about our church history, right? Yeah. You know, you have St. Augustine, you have all the saints of Africa, um, mm -hmm. you know, thousands of them, but you know, why don't we know that here in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know about a lot of popular um, European saints or whatever, 
you know, you know Saint, you, um, but do we know about Athanasius? Do we know about Pope Victor the first? You, you know, and you think about why do we celebrate the Easter the way we do? You know, it's because of Pope Victor. Who was the Pope, um, you know, when Constantine, you know, converted? You, you know, it, it was an African Pope that was there. So, you know, just saying, why don't we know that? Okay, because that would be important to people of color. And when we're really talking about the universality of the church, we don't want to think that this church is just a, uh, a, a European church. It's much larger than that, you know. Um, and, and then, that, and I would say we could also tie in, I, I'm of the mind when it comes to the Orthodox, that really their history is our history. I know that might be a yeah. controversial view. So you have the Ethiopian, the Coptic rites, the Ethiopian church, yep. Indian churches, you know, through Russia and obviously the, the, the Orthodox and, and the Greeks. Um, and you had the, the, the Ethiopian, the early Ethiopian saints and the Ethiopian spirituality and history. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I think it's a combination of a few things. I do wonder, do you know much about the history of the, um, the African-American missions with St. Catherine Drexel yeah. or the Jesuits. How did they do that early on? Let's say before Vatican II, before the 1960s and 70s. I don't know a whole lot about that. And the only thing I know about St. Catherine Drexel is that she built this beautiful church on a Native American reservation in um, South Dakota. And mm -hmm. it is the most neat architecture. It combines traditional um, Native American imagery with like classic Catholic architecture. It's a real gem of a church. I, I think it should be. Uh, I think it should be talked about more. Um, but what I mean, what what do you think of the history? Because there was a, at some points there was even African American um, religious orders in America. How was that? How was that? I, yeah, and there still are. There still are. Yeah. I mean, we have um, one of the. Um, we have about six African Americans who are up for canonization um, mm -hmm. for sainthood right now. You know, you have Pierre Toussaint. Um, Henriette de Lille, um, you know, uh, Mother Greeley, uh, um, Father Tolton, I mean, the first African American priest, you know, in the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have um, a Thea Bowman, you know, we have um, these saints or, or saintly people that are there. But then again, you know, you have like the Catherine Drexels and people who are benefactors. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, St. Monica, downtown Raleigh used yeah. to be an African-American um, church. And then once the churches were integrated, you know, St. Monica is, is now a, a youth center, a teen center, right? And then our first um, black Catholic priest in the diocese, um, you know, Monsignor Haddon, who, mm -hmm. you know, passed away a few years ago, his house is right, right his childhood house is right across the street from that center. Right, and then you go up into Norfolk and you look at the beautiful um, um, basilica up there, and it was a African American church that was actually built, and because of racism, it was burned to the ground. But this, the people who worship there, rebuilt that church, and it was almost overnight. I mean, it really w wasn't literally overnight, but you know, we took Owen up, and he did his, um, he did a paper on it. And it was just amazing, man. And yeah. you look at the artwork and stuff. So, by the way, I, here's a question for you. This yeah. is this reminds me of something. When I, I I saw your article in the Diocese of Raleigh, overall I liked it. But when it came to solutions, like things we could do, I was yeah. like, one idea that you didn't mention. I feel like we need in America is we need good content about the history of African American Catholicism in this yes. country. I don't, I don't know if there's anything available. Maybe I'm wrong. Like I think social media posts, you know, curriculum, like that we could integrate like a six week or whatever or something. Yeah, you know my house, so you know I'm surrounded by a slew of books now, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm glancing over here to look on the shelf, but there there is a book called um, Black Catholicism, mm -hmm. and it basically kind of talks about some of this stuff, um, um, and it was uh, written by Cyprian. Uh, Father Cyprian, I, his uh, last name is escaping me right now, but on the diocese website, and it's kind of hidden down under multicultural ministry, but if you actually go on the diocese website, click on um, 
ministries. And then when you get to multicultural and you click in there and see how many clicks you have to get just to get to this, yeah. um, hopefully we'll get a solution to that too. But mm -hmm. I actually tried to gather as much history as I could, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool because as you start going through there in Fayetteville, and you know this place a little bit better than I do, um, yeah. St. Saint, Saint Anne's, right? In, yeah. in Fayetteville, that church was actually built to be a, um, a integrated church, but it was actually started by six black Catholics and they actually held their meetings and things um, in a barbershop, mm -hmm. you know? And so that has a lot of history. You have Holy Cross here in Durham, you have St. Mary's in Garner, um, you know, you had um, out in, in um, New Bern, St. I want to say St. Paul's mm -hmm. or whatnot. But so those were a lot of, you know, traditionally um, Newton Grove, mm -hmm. you know, so when the Diocese of Raleigh um, sprung up, it sprung up with a lot of um, black Catholics already here. Yeah. And, you, you know, so, so we've been here from the very beginning and that's why it's very important for us in this day and time to, um, not to forget them and let them become invisible um, and, and make sure that, you know, everybody has a uh, seat at the table and to understand, hey, we're foundational um, mm -hmm. to this, just like everybody else is. And let's continue to move forward together um, because it's very easy for a parish a couple of generations out, you know, to have a lot of um, immigrants or, you know, people, um, of different ethnic backgrounds and you would walk in and you go, hmm, you know, this is, this is just a great church, but it's like, no, these things have a lot of history. You know, one of the things I used to do in my parish is I'd go around and actually teach. Um, what is, when you walk through a parish, a parish church, mm -hmm. and you look around at the things, the artwork and a lot of things within those churches will tell you a lot about the peace, people that worship there, right? Mm -hmm. I um, mean, unfortunately, when you lose some of those historical black churches, you you lose that. Um, Agreed. And I think that's uh, the capturing the history. I, I've it has become more clear in my mind the past like month or two on the importance of capturing the history of things, because I, I, I there's certain things I had heard, like when I was studying in a predominantly radical left department and. And generally speaking, I disagree with a lot of politics of those folks. But one of the things that was brought up a lot, a concern, was a tendency of not exploring history or, or exploring history in a very superficial way. And I'll give you a concrete example. One of the things that struck me, I think I was either in college or high school. I can't remember when I first. Have you ever heard this song by Billie Holiday, Strange Fruit? Str have you ever heard that song? You should have to look it up. Yeah. The strange fruit um, blowing on southern trees. It's it's about it's about the the, the violence in the south with lynching yep. and things yep. like that. And I remember hearing that for the first time. I believe it was in college, and it's just like it wasn't just that it was I was being told about a violent past. Now I think that I have heard it said that in the south sometimes they avoid that history. I, I don't know how true that is because I didn't grow up in the south um, where they won't like I've heard it said that in history textbooks, they refuse to show images of like lynchings or anything like that. Um, I've, he I've heard that said, I don't know for certain, but um, but like that piece of music is a profound moment of history. That's beautiful. That's, it's like a pieta and it tells such a beautiful story. Um, and there's other works like that, like the Harlem Renaissance, or um, we're getting into the conversations between um, Booker T. Washington and W. E. Du Bois. Like I don't know how many of the, did I pronounce that right? Du Bois, Du Bois. Yeah, yeah, it's it's French, so du, du Bois, but yeah, Du Bois. Du Bois. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I've I've actually haven't said it or talked about it in about twenty years, which might be part of the problem that we don't generally talk about these things. Um, but the yeah, Du Bois. Yeah, I think you're right, yeah. Du Bois. Um, is how much are like even younger people exposed to those primary texts. Um, yeah. 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 And that's, that's one of the, um, you know, 
by by training, you know, I'm a political scientist. Um, yeah. So, you know, part of that was history and sociology and psychology and kind of looking into um, a lot of that stuff. And that's what I really encourage a lot of people to do is get back to the proof text because, you know, we can always go back and get everybody's shade of it. But if you go back and try to get to the original documents um, in, or even, you know, even with these statues, you know, everybody's talking about it, you know, the history of these Confederate statues and stuff. And it's like, well, okay, well, let's talk about that, you know, and, and when was that statue put up, you know, yeah. and what else was going on in the world at the time those statues were put up. But yeah. one of the things I want to get back to that I thought was kind of interesting, you talked about Billie Holiday and her, the song of, you know, Strange Fruit. But even if you th even go back um, to gospel music, and, you know, the swing low, sweet chariots and all of that stuff, you know, what is that about, you know, and that was a spirituality in a, in the African American community. Um, you, you know, they, they never gave up on that hope, mm -hmm. you know, they were living out some in, in some meager conditions, but, you know, they might be preached um, from the Bible and used against them to verify, see right here in the Bible, it says, you know, it's okay for you to be in servitude, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, uh, people would know a little bit better than that, you, you know, and they would always be singing for that deliverance or looking yeah. forward to that's that. That's a beautiful, that's actually a beautiful example. Hold up a second, my dog. Sharma, go lay down. <laughs> my dog's sitting up in my business. But, um, well, that's a, that's an interesting, I got an interesting story about when I was first exposed to that. I was around 19. I was studying abroad in Spain. So I was at this concert of classical music. And they were going through all the music of history. They were, they were starting, they, well, not all of it, but like they were doing classical music like Bach, Beethoven. And then they came to a piece. I was looking, I was like, I've never heard this phrase before, but they called them Negro spirituals, um, spiritualis negros in Spanish. And so they were like, oh, this is your music. You should know. I was like, you know, I've never actually heard some of this music, but it was fascinating that I was exposed while in Spain. Because in Europe, I don't know if you've, you knew this, the historically black colleges, they would take their choirs throughout Europe. Um, I think back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, some of these historically black colleges would tour Europe and sing a lot of this music, and the Europeans loved it. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of interesting. Um, but yeah. yeah, yeah. But those spirituals, it's neat is actually there's a lot of parallels with Catholicism that they use a lot of what we call typography, right? So Moses, liberation from Egypt you know, Babylon, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, and, and that's why now you'll see um, we have probably three gospel choirs um, within within the diocese. Mm -hmm. And when they get together, I mean, you can see them if um, at the MLK mass that we, the, the uh, mass for peace and justice that we do usually in February, mm -hmm you know, you'll get a flavor of that. But if you happen to go to um, any of these parishes that I spoke about, um, you know, you would actually probably be exposed to some of those songs too. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's really meaningful, especially to people who are um, converts from or, or coming into the church from another uh, Chris, or Christian de denomination. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they hear those songs and they're like, oh, Catholics sing that song too. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know, I mean, it, you, you know, it's, it's part of our, our spirituality. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting history. So if we could go back a little bit, I don't know, do you want to, do you want to talk about the beginnings with slavery in the early America or do you want to, do you want to explore some of the history a little bit more or? Yeah. So, so, okay. So, um, you know, you look at, societies that came over with you know africans who came over with the spanish um mm -hmm. to florida right and you have saint augustine florida and fort Mo moise is right next to it predominantly mm -hmm. black predominantly catholic right yeah. um you get into the american revolution and then you have chris crispus atticus right he's um the first person who actually died and that little skirmish that he died in is what really kicked off the American Revolution, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at, from a political standpoint, you know, Africans at that time were used as political pawns too, 
right? Yep. So, you know, okay, if you fight for us in the crown, you know, if we beat these rebellious, you know, Americans, then, mm -hmm. you know, we'll free you or whatever. And um, on the flip side, you know, the Americans are like, well, if you fight for us, you, you know, um, we'll, we'll be free, to, you'll be free too. And some of these people were already free and they were like, well, you don't want to be a slave. But then that's when you have people that say, okay, well, mm -hmm. and you know, the, 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 um, the, the American, um, the national anthem, you know, you look at the third or fourth verse and, you know, it's talking about the slaves or whatever. And it's like, okay, so, you know, there was always this separation and people figure, oh, well, they were racist, right? Because they yeah. wanted to do well, away it was, with a, it was a weird, it was a weird moment in history. Yeah. And I don't think I, I saw a museum piece once that put it really well. The complexities of the enlightenment are still not appreciated because they, people say, well, it's white people, it's white history. It's always been there, but it was a particular moment in history that a few things happened, right? So Europeans were, had vast military superiority to everybody in the world for a period of history there, right? right? The British army couldn't be defeated. The French army, the Spanish, the only the only threats they had were each other. But when it came to the African countries, the Japanese, the Chinese, overwhelming military power. Also in the founding of our idea of our country was the, the ideas of the enlightenment and combination with the developments in Catholic thought was they started to develop the idea of universal human rights, which was not completely, it was, it was kind of a new concept. Like, I mean, it's there in Christianity in some regards, but before that, it was generally assumed that you just conquered people, right? I mean, that's kind of how human history went. Yep. I mean, the only, the only difference between the losers and the winners was not that like the losers you know, were peaceful, but just generally speaking, they had lesser military capacity. And so the idea of universal human rights and some of these things start to develop. Like you can't, the, the, there's, there's, ba there's boundaries to countries. And there is definitely a vast hypocrisy in the enlightenment that paradoxically, while this idea of liberty is being promoted in France, they also, there's vast persecutions and at the same, in France of Catholics and things like that. It was, it was just this tension at the time. Mm -hmm. I think you see that with the founding fathers. They had these noble ideals, but they also had these profound hypocrisies, um, which, I mean, I think it extended a little bit beyond just simply um, African-Americans. I think they were somewhat hostile to the Catholic church as well. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. They were hostile to the Catholic church. Um, but one of the things where it, it kind of separates now, what happens if you're a black Catholic? Yeah. You, you know, they, you, you doubly get it, right? Yeah. Um, but if, if, if we really think about what really um, is the sin, the sin in all of that is when you actually took those Africans for a financial um, gain, like the South did, and made them less than another human. Yeah. Right. And, and so you had basically set a foundation where these people were nothing more than um, like a mule. You mm -hmm. know, I could pay for them just like I paid for a mule or a cow or an ox or whatever. You know, they were basically um, bought and traded as a commodity versus, you know, live, being able to live their human dignity. And then as you have these abolitionists and these troublemakers, you know, that want to come in and free these people and make them regular people. Um, and what you see through history is even in this United States, and that's one thing that we can um, look back on and say, at least with um, that struggle, some people were struggling for um, a better position for all human beings. But then there was this active contingent of people who were actively against that um, and then sometimes unfortunately those people had the ultimate political power yeah. you know you think about tomorrow we'll be celebrating the independence of the country but um you know we just talked about juneteenth mm -hmm. you know a couple of weeks ago and it's like okay yeah just because the emancipation proclamation happened 
how many years after the American Revolution did did these other people actually get their freedom? And then even when the emancipation was signed, how long did it take for the union to get all the way out to Texas to muster up enough people to tell these people, hey, knock it off, free these people. It's been two, two or three years. And we told you this is over, but you refuse to do it. So now we have to put military power and might behind it to force you into submission, right? And then you still have those people today who um, may be living out that history, yeah. right? And I mean, you look at, and then we can, we can move forward from um, the civil war and then you move into, um, you know, the world wars or whatever, you know, we, yeah, we have black soldiers, you know, we had a Tuskegee airman, but that was an experiment. You know, you had the black soldiers, but you couldn't, or sailors, you couldn't be anything but a cook or a porter, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you still have segregated units. And then finally, you know, the military said, okay, well, we're going to integrate, right? Mm -hmm. But just because that happens and just because we sign something on the line or just because our bishops write these beautiful documents about racism, mm -hmm. until we actually put some weight in soldiers behind that and when i say soldiers here i'm talking about you know faithful active catholics in the pews mm -hmm. they you know live out their um christian dignity and go out and meet those evils head on then it's nothing more than just you know scribbles on a piece of on parchment that makes sense absolutely absolutely i think to arrive at that you know, one of the things that I, you know, you mentioned the bishops having a good document, which I would slightly disagree with. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I think it was well intended to denounce the evil of racism. But one of the things that I've been most disappointed in all of this, the past three months that I've tried to try to shed some light on is we need some more teeth on, like, we can't just say there's injustice. We have to talk about, well, what what does injustice mean? So I talk about distributive versus commutative justice. What, what, how do we define justice? Like what's owed somebody? You know, distributive justice is what does society or a group owe the individual? And then commutative justice is what do people owe each other? Right. And so when we talk about systematic racism, it would be a violation of distributive justice, but trying to understand some of the, the, the disagreements and concepts that lie underneath and to really flesh out a language. And I think part of it, and this was kind of what we were discussing the history. I think to flesh out some of these ideas, a lot of these ideas are actually present in the history of African-Americans. Um, we look at, for example, Washington versus Du Bois and their different philosophies. So we have Washington, right? Who's, you know, kind of up by your bootstraps. Let's build a culture step-by-step. Step. And Du Bois, it was more like, let's reform it and let's let's kind of almost a little bit more of a revolutionary spirit so i mean could you riff on that a little bit i mean what are your thoughts on because that? that is kind of like two views that we almost have right now even now in this debate which is building re you know building a, a culture from the ground up which at this point is not from the ground up it's more going from good to better i would say because we now have we clearly have african americans in all walks of life a real question now is how do we handle some of the issues among lower income, poor people across the board, but particularly within the African-American community. And then there's Du Bois, who's more of a revolutionary. So yeah, I'd be curious your thoughts on that a little bit. Well, yeah. And actually, um, I think another person that you don't want to um, um, exclude from that would also be uh, Marcus Garvey too. Yeah. You know, so you, you, like you said, you know, um, and I think the struggle there was, okay, now we're free, yeah. you know, so what do we do with this freedom? You know, do we, as, as Booker T would say, um, you know, accept where we are and, um, and, and live it out the best we can, or do we, you know, burn it down and start from scratch? Or mm -hmm. do we say, you know, forget the whole thing, get away from the oppression and get a fresh start wherever we need to, right? So those were kind of really the three, you yeah. know, accept where you are, um, work inside that, mm -hmm. and eke out 
a better living than you had before or no, you know what, we're going to, uh, we're going to take these uh, systems that are in place. We're going to reshuffle them so that the deck is fair um, all the way across the board and we're going to move forward. Or it's like, you know what, I don't even want to play this game. I'm off the table altogether. I'm going to my own room with my own people and we're going to, you know, kind of do our own thing. Yeah. Which in our current context would be black nationalism movements and things like that, which is plays into a little bit of these protest dynamics that there are some groups within the left that argue for kind of black nationalism yeah. um, where blacks, African-Americans would have their own kind of country. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I have visited enough other countries not to be the Marcus Garvey in a way I, you know, I'm not trying to leave the United States. I, you know, <laughs> I, I don't care how many warts the, the, the tur, tur, um, tortoise has or um, frog has. I, I think I'll deal with the warts than to end up with a snake or a lizard, you know. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I've been fortunate enough to um, have to live under certain things. And when I say that, you know, and this is would be something that, um, you know, you'll hear a lot of African-American moms, they'll, they'll articulate this now and, and more so, more so to mothers, but you'll hear the fathers saying it too, you know, I am raising young black men, young black women, and I fear it every day when they walk out the door that they might not come back, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that shouldn't be something that's on the heart of a parent. And, and that's a parent who has lived under a structure of things where, um, and you take, you know, um, I, I guess profiling, right? Racial profiling. And depending on that, that child's temperament, you know, if they get pulled over and they know they haven't done anything wrong. And you know, being a kid and your parents put you in a timeout or, you know, you get punished for something you didn't do, there's a righteous indignation that, that, that wells up inside of you, right? And it's like, oh no, why am I getting punished for that? You know, and so some will do that but you know whatever the stereotype is oh they're being they're being uh, they're resisting arrest why didn't they just you know lay down and take it well you know it's an injustice that has been done to me right mm -hmm. um so that's you know a thing to look at so if you're living under that type of mentality then you're like okay um when i go out if i get pulled over by the cops I have my hands on 10 and, or, you know, you know, uh, three and three and 10, right. Or 10 and two. What is it? You know, and you're yeah. sitting there. Well, you, you know, it's funny. Actually, I encountered that once we were in Nebraska and um, the guy who was driving was Hispanic. He's from Texas. And when we got pulled over, I'm like, I, I, I really, I realized that afterwards, like he was kind of nervous. Like he put his hands up on like this. I'm like, you know, I think you're overreacting. <laughs> And see, that's the funny thing about it. And we sit here and we laugh about that, but that has actually been ingrained and that is a reality. Yeah, I'm sure with Hispanics too, like if you're like Hispanic yeah. in Texas. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I mean, to be a little bit fair, there's a lot of like drug trafficking going through Texas, but, but yeah, there's, but there's also, that's like, that's a difficult, that's a difficult thing where, yeah. whereas generally, I mean, to be honest, a white person hypothetically could experience that if they dressed a certain way or had a certain thing, but that's really within our purview and within some purview, to, like, like, for example, um, like if you're wearing a grateful dead t-shirt and like you're wearing a, you know, a beanie or something, you know, your chance of getting searched for drugs are probably a little bit higher, you know, in, you know, but yeah. that's not so much based on race. It's more based on some external factors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that that you spoke about goes back to where we find ourselves today, where everybody's profile. Yeah. You know, you think about it. I mean, if I want to sell you anything, and you notice if you're on Facebook, there's certain things that come up in your feed. And it's like, well, how did you know I was just looking at X, Y, Z? And why are you, because you've been profiled, right? Mm -hmm. But now if you take this and also marry that profiling to a, um, a group of people who have traditionally um, been in tension with, with the black community. And you think about it in the South, 
it was your law enforcement people who were that, um, you know, you didn't have a fighting chance. If you stepped out of line, yeah. you know, the sheriff, the local policemen, they didn't have any sympathy for you, you know, and if you were a little bit too uppity, you know, you'd be that strange fruit, right? Yeah. So when that has been your history for, um, for so long, and you think about if you were a slave and you were running for your freedom, you know, they put the bounty hunters out on you, right? Yeah. And now, you know, you move forward. Okay, so you're supposed to be in this free society, but if you sit in the wrong place on the bus, the law enforcement people come and get you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so now- like A lot of our older folks right now would have lived through some of that or recently thereafter. And the right. thing that magically after the 60s and 70s, that magically that all those people who are critical in their 20s and 30s suddenly just disappeared from society is a little naive. Right. Um, right. Little, yeah. Um, by the way, interesting question. Uh, this is a fun fact. You know, with the last city to integrate, to try to do integration, what year and what city? No. Not Southern. Not no. Southern. No. Uh, would it, would it, it be? was Boston in 85. Right. The Irish. <laughs> <laughs> the Irish. No, seriously, there was rioting. You can look it up. I'm I'm 99% sure on this. I think it was 85. I'm pretty sure. Cool. So, yeah. I mean, so that's like, that's pretty recent history, which is a dynamic. If you're up in the Northeast, I mean, you know, Jim Gaffigan has that joke about the, he calls it the corridor of hate between Philadelphia and Boston. Yeah. But there's a lot of racial tensions in those big cities. And it's not just white and black. It's like Puerto Ricans and Mexicans. It's Jews and Filipinos or what? who knows? I mean, and I've lived in some of those environments where you're like, you know, there's all these tensions, right? Yeah, that, that, was, that was my city. You know, if you were um, on the east side, you were either African-American, Jewish, Puerto Rican, or, you know, some kind of mil Middle Eastern, right? Yeah. And then if you're on the west side, you um, would have been um, Irish, you know, more to Anglo, um, yeah. Italian, you know, um, group group of people. And it was kind of funny, um, give you a little bit of my history. So my stepdad is from the West Side mm -hmm. and my mom is from the East Side. So you think about that in the 60s and 70s, yeah. you know, you're married in this time of tension. So you got this black lady and this white guy that are married um, mm -hmm. when, you know, the world is still like, hey, whoa, whoa. Yeah. You know, we're separate. Okay, you can be equal, but you're not supposed to. Um, so there was a lot of tension in that, you know. So when you're growing up, and and so I, as a um, as a child inside that type of dynamics within the household, was able to kind of sit back and say, "Wow." So you know, I, I uh, was able to, um, you know, sit down and take some good notes on where the tension was, um, in 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 how it all played out. And what I thought was funny is that I was treated differently than my mom was treated, you know, within our own family. And then, or my dad was treated if he was on my side of the, you know, with my side of the family, you know, it was still that interesting dynamic there. And then my dad being in the Marine Corps, we get stationed down to Camp Lejeune and, you know, my mom's Baptist, my dad's Catholic. Um, they wanted me to have a good Christian education. So even when I was in school, I was always in Catholic school. So I'm in Catholic school in the South. And all of a sudden, I'm the only black face in the whole school. Whereas in Cleveland, I mean, the whole, all the, all the kids in the class were black, except for, I think the only white face in the, and there was a the second grade teacher, <laughs> you know, even the kindergarten and I, I first grade teacher were black. So it's just like, wow mm -hmm. you know so it was it was a dynamic there as well but uh yeah. but Did going you, back going back to that though so the history of the tension between um the races and then also the cultures too um was something that was big but um, i i still think that um for the most part um african americans have a unique experience with the law in law enforcement, in the government, that's, um, I, I would say, unique to um, other folks. 
and then you add on this other ethnic enclave um, distinctions as well. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you get, you get some even more interesting dynamics to go along with that. Well, and, and let's, let's, I mean, let's not forget like the, the music of the eighties, nineties through, I mean, what was the, what was it? Um, you have like Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and, you know, I mean, that, that played into a lot of it and it was, it was complex. There's actually a good book. Um, I don't agree with his politics at all. Um, Dr. Mark Anthony Neal, have you ever heard of him? He teaches no. at Duke. He, um, very interesting intellectual, hardcore left-wing, um, Black Panther type. I had him as a professor at SUNY Albany. I should look him up at Duke. I don't know if we would be simpatico right now. He, he was always good to talk with. I don't know how he would feel about talking with a, a Catholic priest who's a little bit right of center, so to speak. Um, I don't know how he would feel about that now, but I would love to talk to him. I probably should reach out to him. But he wrote a good book about what the music says. He talks a little bit about the history of hip hop. That was one of his areas of expertise. And, um, and, and really that music of the 80s and 90s, that activist music, Rage Against the Machine. Um, what's the other one? Um, there's there's KRS-One and some of the more activists. Yeah, in, Public Enemy. Yeah. Public Enemy. But they didn't have as big of an impact as Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, um, NWA, um, you know, in terms of like controversy, right? Because there's that song, um, um, Yeah, and You Don't Stop, and it's 187 on a yeah yeah yep. um so that tension that that i mean that's not that's not too long ago that 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 was the one of the driving forces in these but i mean even getting at that history of the 60s and 70s it i i'm of the mind i i may be wrong on this but there was some ugliness with the fbi and african-american movements in the 60s and 70s through the 80s which is, you know, the, you know, planting drugs. There's, there's a widely held belief that I, I think is rel I think there's some merit to that in places like LA that they actively promoted drugs to destabilize African American communities. I mean, these are part of the stories that are being told that I still think are pretty fresh. I mean, we're talking eighties, nineties. We're not yeah. talking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause even like I said too, if you even think about, and we were talking about this earlier um, when I mean, I'll be 51 um, in, in a couple of days here, but so I'm, I'm, I'm born in 69. You know, you have all the history of, that's still fresh. You know, if you really think about in, in a lifetime, you know, a lot of that stuff is fresh. And then what you're talking about is even more, more recent and is during our lifetime. And I think um, when you're talking about the music, the one uh, hip hop guy that comes to mind for me was Curtis Blow. And he had a song that was called The Breaks. And what it was really talking about in that, that genre, when it first started out, was really them reporting um, their, their situation. Yeah. And then it just continued, you know. And when you think about LA, you know, the 187, you know, and NWA and Public Enemy, don't call 911 because if you live in a black neighborhood, they're not going to show up, yeah. you know. Um, and, and they did it in a way, and I think people who appreciated that music and listened to what the message was underneath it was like, wow, it made them start um, being more aware. And even the question you asked me about that racial corridor um, with Boston and everything. And that's what we're asking people to do is to be like you were, or be like those people listening to that hip hop and actually look into what is really going on. What's the message and actually doing some research for yourself. Because, you know, we can either deny it and say it didn't happen, which basically means you're not listening. It, you, you imagine if you called um, your Apple iPhone people and said, you know, my iPhone's not working. And then they just said, OK, thank you very much and hung up. You'd be frustrated. So when somebody is voicing a complaint, you know, that's why these companies spend a lot of money on customer service departments, because they want to fig figure out what their customers, customers complaints are listen to them and see if they can come up with solutions to improve their product or service. Right. Yeah. And so for us to improve our race relations, we really need to just have that ear, whether you agree with it or not, you know, at least have a open ear and a docile heart to um, hear the grievance and um, 
in in and then say let me be sure that i understand what's going on because like you found out you were like wow and so you just taught me something i didn't realize boston was the last one you know but if we're having this kind of conversation amongst friends and if we can become like this mm -hmm. then i think we can uh, do a better job and um, improving race relations and also in our generation and time um, address the beast of um, of racism yeah and I think, you know, like I was mentioning, one of the things I think is a solution is um, a resurgence of art. I think right now the problem has become is that art is almost starting to take on more of an, an era of propaganda. And, um, and there's not the, the nuances that I saw. And I think back, maybe there's some of this work being created but I don't know for certain. I, I would, but I look back and even somebody like James Baldwin, who I profoundly disagree with, I think there's problems with himself and his art because, um, you know, of his homosexuality and some of those things. There's a nuance to how he presents things. Richard Wright, native, native son. Um, uh, I, I mentioned The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting book because it gets at one of the complexities of the African-American experience is this relationship between the African-American community and the radical left. Some people seem to think that this is just a recent development, but it, at least back as far back as the, the 1910 and 1920s, there was a concerted effort first by the, the Bolsheviks, the, the Russian communists, to use African-Americans as a way of overthrowing the American system. Because there was obvious oppression at that time. It yeah. was obvious to everybody in the world. And so they would use, because I mean, if you ever heard of the one guy, he ended up getting blacklisted for this, a big, huge African-American singer, beautiful, like bass voice, one of the most best singers of all time. And he sang in Russia, let my people go. And I think for that, he, um, what's his name? Yeah. I, I, he, but he, he, he was, and so they were, there was a sense that like this relationship between the African-American community and the communism was a tricky one. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, you know, I mean, you think about uh, Dr. King, that was one of the things uh, too, you know, it was like, oh, he's aligning himself with, um, you know, with uh, the communists, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. So there- I think Dr. King did a really good job of avoiding that tendency. I think we really lost something profound when he was assassinated. Yeah, because he was very much more rooted. You know what his PhD dissertation was on? It's interesting. Augustine. I don't know exactly on what, but it was on Augustine, I believe. Yeah, it was on something related to Augustine's theology. That was his PhD, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but yeah, yeah. But he was much more, as I read a sermon by him once where he was very critical of relativism and modernism. And I have to go back and dig some of these up, but he was much more of a, uh, a moderate pro Christian pro he was an anti-Western thought. Um, he was operating more within Western thought. Whereas Malcolm X, on the other hand, there was that st stark tension between the two of them. Malcolm X was much more, we need to overthrow, well, more of a black nationalism. We need to, we need to carve out a, a black nation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually um, I think, Malcolm X is when he was when he was looking he was like well you know what um, there's there's an interesting history um, there's a book called the black the Negro and the gun I believe it is and it's really talking about um, you know African Americans really had two they 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 had um, two philosophies one is you know peaceful resistance kind of the uh, Martin Luther King, you know, nonviolent protest. But then you also had, from the Malcolm X standpoint, you know, we're going to have, um, you know, a, a, a way to defend ourselves if we have to. Yeah. So, you know, when we show up to the polls to vote, you know, while I'm in voting, yeah, my wife's going to have the, the Remington or the, you, you know, mm -hmm. um, just in case things jump off, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to cast my vote the way I want to. Um, 
you, you know, and if it has to be that I, you know, defend myself, even with the uh, level of violence. And so, yeah, you, you had that. Um, so there were those two um, schools of thought as well. And to be fair, as much as some of those ideas are scary for Malcolm X, I don't, I don't advocate them in the Black Panther Party. They were met with some pretty hardcore resistance from the FBI and infiltration, informants, drugs, violence. It, 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 was, it was pretty ugly. And, yeah. and some of the, the kids of those people are around. So there's uh, Fred Hampton Jr. who's dead. I actually saw Fred Hampton Jr. speak. Hardcore leftist, wants to overthrow commu- uh, capitalism, hardcore Marxist. Um, and his, he, you know, the story he heard growing up was about how his dad was, you know, killed in bed while his mom was there. And that they put a gun to his mom's womb and said, we should kill the N word now yep. before he grows up. Yep. I mean, I don't know if there's a good guy in that. I mean, it's hard to find it. <laughs> I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. Because I I'm mean, not a big fan of Fred Hampton Jr. I mean, but yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you look at, it was funny, you know, you were talking about something and I was actually looking and right on my desk, I'd found my copy from, from school <laughs> um, way back when. And I was like, oh man, I, I remember we had to read that um, in one of my political science classes too. But, uh, but, you know, when you really talk about overthrowing capitalism and blah, blah, blah. You know, there was a lot of um, those hands. Remember I was talking about all the different hands that were in the stoking of flames. And so you think about, you had the KKK, you know, um, you also had Margaret Sanger and her whole eugenics thing. And the interesting thing that people don't understand is why she was doing that here in the United States, getting that all riled up. You know where it reared his ugly head the most? Was in Germany, yeah, and that's where yeah, the Holocaust, you, you know, it it it, it, yeah. it flew right out of the United States and and rooted hor- horrifically in Germany. Yeah, and the eugenics was a movement that was based kind of in Enlightenment reasons. The scientific, it was kind of that science would demonstrate the superiority of white people, and so some of the things that they would do is there's even examples of this to the sixties and seventies where there's a famous study that actually what I've been told was that Hillary Clinton herself was a part of this study mm. was where they would measure the, the heads of everybody. Um, and, and they would say, well, certain kinds of head frames, if you have a bigger head or whatever, you know, that there yeah. was a sign and normally it tilted towards if you were Caucasian and smaller framed or whatever, yeah. um, that, that you were more intelligent. Or whatever. Right. Right. It hadn't, um, it had nothing to do with the pheno. I mean, your actual phenotype may have some, um, you, you know, some uh, say in that, you know, just from your genes or whatever, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting. So the, the eugenics, the, some of those ideas were, 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 were pretty popular up to the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then, yeah. And then obviously, you know, you had your law enforcement. Um, and you know, you don't know who's in that blue suit sometimes, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you know, there are people who go for that badge that gives them that level of authority, right? And so this is these are the things that we're talking about where you know it really leads us lends itself to white supremacy. When we talk about racism, this is where white supremacy uh, finds itself in these type of things like, you know, we're going to use science or some kind of study to show that, you know, whites are better, better than blacks, or, you know, um, we're going to use a, a power of terrorism to always keep them submissive and below us, um, you know, and then we may have to use certain elements of the government mm-hmm. um, to infiltrate and, and, you know, weaken these people from, um, from within if we have to, or, you know, push come to show, we'll just all out just stand on them. Yeah. And I think where a lot of people stand is there has been something that's happened in politics. Yeah. Just been talking for, there has been a shift in politics the last 15, 20 years that it's, um, 
Yeah, it's an interesting shift in politics. Like, I think that's one of the things where people are struggling with right now is how much of those, those dynamics have gone away, how much have they shifted, how much are they still there? Um, I think if we, most of what we've discussed up through, say, the 90s, I think most reasonable people would agree on some of those dynamics. The question really has become, what has happened to the two-party system since the, and, and I don't think we need to cover that right now, but I think that's been the shifting landscape. Because I mean, I know now from my experience of living in the North, living in the South, living in um, different communities, now living in a rural community, is that in my local community um, in Greenville, it is very clear that many people who are conservative are very much on the front lines of helping low-income and marginalized groups, whether they're African-American, Hispanic, or whatever. Um, there's definitely still some folks, I think there's some racial tensions. In our area, it tends to be a little bit more Hispanic versus American, Spanish yeah. speakers versus not, because you know there's a significant Mexican, uh, Mexican-American population, and it's predominantly Mexican-American. There are other Hispanic groups, but the tensions are more with those folks who are Mexican-American who are kind of making their way up. And, um, but very much within our community, and I think this is where I'm kind of coming from these days, is it's not clear that the, the, the divide between racist and not racist is conservative liberal. But if you're conservative, you're automatically racist. And if you're liberal, you're automatically not racist. I mean, there's been so many anecdotal examples either way. Yeah. Where I think one of the big things that I want to get at, I see the divide now more between how do things move forward? Is it like a federal government thing? Is it, a, you know, is it a law thing? Because even so, I've, I've even pointed out some of the areas with the highest racial tensions are actually not controlled by conservatives, but they're more controlled by liberals, right? So Minneapolis is historically a more liberal area, Minnesota, yeah. Chicago, New York, LA. Um, so it's hard to say that it's simply a black and white, conservative, racist, liberal, not conservative area, racism, liberal area, not. Okay. So um, allow me to bring my political scientist out a little yeah. bit here. It, okay. So what I'm, what I'm, seeing is that I think across the country in general, um, people have taken an eye off of the person that they voted for and allowed them um, carte blanche yeah. to do do whatever. And what these guys have done is they whisper sweet nothings into everybody's ear and mm -hmm. then they get to Washington or, you know, the state capitol and they get into the system um, of power and they will that power um, to their benefit mm -hmm. and not necessarily to benefit their constituency. And it's time for the constituency to, um, to understand that, you know, they're there to represent us. We're really the boss. And if they can't do it, you know, send their high knees back home and let them live under some of the garbage that they've um, legislated into our lives, right? Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, um, I think some folks on both sides have been co-opted into um, uh, their political party and they've let these people, you know, sit um, nursing off of the taxpayer for 40, 50 years, you know, and they've whispered those sweet no nothings into the ear every, every four years or however, whatever their cycle is. And then once they get back up there, they don't really affect any change at all. Yeah, and I, what I would, I would encourage everybody to realize is how much local politics is actually vitally important. Like if your police department is causing problems, it's connected more with your mayor than with the president. Like, yeah. I mean, and that's one of the things, this COVID crisis, going to switching gears a little bit to COVID-19, what I have found is the importance incredibly profound importance of local politics um, and how important local politics is as much as federal politics play into it. Yeah. 
you know, it's more your mayor, it's more your congressman, it's more your senator than it is the president. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's what I mean, because I, I could tell many stories about how I had to pull strings to have things happen. And it was because I'd had relationships, most of them because they were Catholic and they, a lot of them happened to be parishioners. Yeah. Um, you'd be surprised how many politicians in Eastern North Carolina are Catholic. It's, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a fascinating dynamic, even yeah. though we're not, a, we're actually a minority um, statistically, like 10% of the population. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, the, the local politics piece, which I mean, I would encourage, I mean, in Minneapolis, for example, I mean, I think the defund the police, however you want to view it, I don't, I don't want to get into all that, but your ability to have profound effects on your local politics and to shape that is huge. Yeah. And I'm, you know, as being, you know, faithful Catholics too, one of the things that we need to be very aware of is how this country works. Yeah. You know, and, and I hate to say it, but I don't think our schools are doing civics of justice here, yeah. you know, and, and, and you can see it playing out now um, because like you said, people are upset about things that are happening in their local community and they want to go running to Washington saying it's Obama, it's Trump, you know, it's Bush, is is Clinton. But it's like, no, it, it could be that mayor or that governor you know, right there in your area. And then, you know what, too, part of it falls on us, you know, because if some, I, I mean, I'm a precinct chairman for my political party in, 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 in my city, you, you know? And so it's like, if I'm going to affect change, I can start by affecting the change in my neighborhood. Yeah. You know, and it's funny, it, it, we've, uh, you know, gone out, sometimes too and put up the campaign signs and so the kids know where the perimeter of our precinct is yeah. and so sometimes we'll go out and we'll get ice cream and we'll say hey let's drive around the precinct and then you know <laughs> we'll drive around you know a couple of square square miles of our precinct and say you know what we can affect change here um to start which, with that which i think this is where there's a revolution in my mind of media is right now our local politicians were awesome with this you can now actually connect more with your local politicians and find out what they're doing through social media. Yeah. If they're not on social media, you can kind of call them out on that. Like, why aren't you talking about what you're doing? Um, Cause during the COVID crisis, I was very blessed that I had a lot of their numbers, but also on social media, our Congressman, our mayor, our politicians were on social media, giving updates, giving local information yeah. um, you know, from the horse's mouth, as they say. Yeah. Um, but dude, man, this was a long conversation. This was fun too. I, no, no, uh, I, I, I was like, okay, where are we going to go with this? But I think it kind of, the, the spirit um, uh, led us where we needed to go. Yeah, thanks think, for taking the risk. You know, when we yeah. were talking before, I was like, I'm, like t I'm telling you, man, people are forgiving. Just get on yeah. there. We can just talk. It'll be great. Yep. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's, it's only, you know, I can only give from my experience and, you know, um, my little piece of the pie. But if I can add anything to... Um, you know, help us get um, to where we need to be. But I will say this last thing in closing yeah. is the, I, you know, I was talking about us on a political level, um, addressing things within our own community, but on a personal level from our spirituality as faithful and active Catholics, we need to look at ourselves and say, you know, are there any things in my life um, that, um, you, you know, kind of put me in a negative light from a racial standpoint. Um, you know, is it things that we say around the table like, oh, I was out trying to get get um, a good deal on this car and the guy tried to, tried to Jew me down. You know, where does that come from, right? Or, you know, um, if, if you, uh, somebody at work, you know, gets on you um, for being late, and you look at it because you're the black person is getting called out for being tardy and they're not calling out anybody else because they're, you know, on time or early, then it's not that they're racist. It's just that you're a knucklehead and, you, yeah. and you're getting to work late. And, and it might not be your knucklehead, but whatever adjustment you need to make to be able to get there on time so that, you know, you can be um, a productive 
um, part of the organization as well. And, you know, not just being so quick that anything a white person or a black person says is like, oh, it's racist. Because yeah. I'll give you this last example and then, then I, I'll, I'll shut up. But um, most recently, I'm on social media and the video shows that uh, family where the husband in the pink shirt comes out with the, 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 the AK-47 and the wife has got the little pistol and she's kind of <laughs> holding it. Well, that's the, that's the thing I did. I kind of laughed at the way she was holding the pistol, right? And, you know, I made some comments. I'm like, you got to be kidding. This has got to be a joke. This cannot be real. And um, I got jumped on just because they saw that I was a black man. They figured, oh, well, I was taking the sides of the protesters or whatever, or, you know, I was making fun of the white people. But I'm like, no. And, and so one of the guys was a police officer and he goes, okay, well, Tristan Evans, you know, how should she be holding the gun? And I was like, well, somebody who's been trained to use a firearm, I said, she reminds me of the um, action, fi the GI Joe action figure where you tried to put the gun in his hand and it would never be straight. It would always be crooked. And then he immediately laughed and goes, oh yeah, they do look terrible. Right. But his initial knee jerk reaction was, oh, he was going to put me in a box because he saw me as a black person and he wanted to comment on my comment from that perspective. When in reality, I was just making an observation that if that lady didn't hold that gun a little bit better, she had a potential to shoot her husband in the butt or, you know, shoot one of the protesters by accident. So, um, yeah. Well, and that's a fascinating day. Oh no, we'll leave it there. Sorry, it, it, for hours. We'll have to do this again, man. This was fun. Absolutely. We'll yeah, well, this is so much fun. I'll let you have final say. Thanks so much, Tristan. We'll definitely do it again. I All think right, I got to bring you out to ECU here. Newman, by the way. We got to coordinate that. So. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. All right. The family loves you, man. Yeah, yeah I love you guys too, man. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye bye.